Kareem, how's that look?
I really seriously like I thought you Yeah. Good. What is the what is the name of the play? So it's called Ways of Love. Starts out a little thing you like to do, you have to be completely open. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's it, what should be done? And indeed, my understanding of life, relationship, death has already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on that. Um, 
thank you everybody for coming to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here, the Graduate Center CUNY. For those of you who already came to other readings, welcome back. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the Siegel Theater Center, and I'm here with our really fantastic team of Yu Chen, the producer, and Michael up there, Bella, uh, Paloma, Elida, Elida, and uh, oh. Salma, and so, so many, many on who made this uh, possible. It is the second day of our uh, festival, which is really close to our heart. It's the Penwell Voices Festival. For over 10 years, it has been the privilege for us to collaborate with Penn, uh, this great writers organization uh, on this uh, festival. I admire that organization. It's one of the great ones. They uh, not only give out one of the most significant literary prizes uh, in the world, but they also fight for freedom for right. And they have gotten writers out of prison and they made us also aware of, of writers who are persecuted because of their beliefs. Or like we learned last night from that great play uh, from Stefano Massini, Russian writers who got killed and uh, put their life on the line to report from Czechnia and from Russia and from all places in the world on what to do, what we should be doing and paying attention to. Um, the festival was created by Paul Oster and Salman Rushdie during the first Bush government. They felt very strongly there was a tunnel vision in America. Not enough voices were being heard. 95 to 96 percent of all books come from the US market or from the British market. Only four to five percent uh, not, uh, and half of these were French or German because the governments of these countries believe strongly in subsidizing it. So you end up with one or two books uh, uh, out of a hundred that represent up 180 or 200 other countries, and it would be unthinkable for musicians uh, uh, not to listen to music from around the world. Every great musician knows what is being played in Africa and Australia and Asia in Japan, and it's important for local practice to think globally, but to act locally, but you need to know what is happening in the world. And this festival, I think, does that. And um, we here at the Siegel Bridge Academia in professional theater, international and American theater, it's our hope that these plays will go also to places. And the play company uh, will produce, for example, the play we did last night, and I can't wait uh, to see it, as they have many others. So it is our hope uh, that this will also uh, work out. We have a great guest without here who came from Burkina Faso. This is Aristide Tanagda, who really came to us, who flew in for over 20 hours. <laughs> My guess, you know, to be with us here for the reading, we try to get all the writers here. It's very exceptional. We would like to thank Marvin Carlson, the Rudin Foundation, and many others uh, to make this happen. It's very exceptional, and it's a big privilege for us to have that support. But thank you for coming. He's a great man of theater. He uh, runs a great and significant festival, and we all do not know enough about parts of the world. And uh, I'm ashamed to say, uh, over 10 years or 12, I think mostly this is the first play from uh, Burkina Faso, and there's no reason that this hasn't happened uh, before. So again, thank you for coming and taking time out uh, in the middle of the day. I know how busy you all are. We need good theater, but we also need good audiences, informed audience, audiences that are interested. Though it means a lot to us, so really uh, our uh, appreciation. Um, to uh, all of you for taking the uh, time um, out. And um, it is now time to uh, take your cell phone, and I'll do the same and find it and make sure it is uh, turned off. Where is it? It should be somewhere. <coughs> Here it is. So we don't, uh, yeah, so there's Mitchell. So please make sure. Um, it is uh, not on. Karim, the directors, thank you so much uh, for doing this. There will be a small discussion, a short discussion afterwards, or a bit longer one. The play is about 50 minutes. 40, 50 minutes, so we, we will have time. And here's a voice uh, of a writer, a great writer, a master of his field, from his field, who wrote something that said it was important and good enough to be a story to show in Burkina Faso. Now we have it here, and you have the privilege to hear um, what he has to say and what he came up with. So it's a great honor. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you uh, will also stay for the other readings. Thank you. <clears throat> Allow 
me, Mr. Prosecutor. Allow me to go look at the Boglu for the last time. For the last time, I want to see the wind caress that hill over there. I just need to hear the breath of the sun to savor the smile of the dove who flies through the womb of the Boglu. I just want to be face to face with the dove. For once, there's something I want, even though I've never wanted anything. For once, I dare to dream, so don't keep me from that. I will speak, but I won't speak the truth because I don't know what it is. I don't know my right hand. I know, I know, I know, Mr. Prosecutor. I learned that being left-handed was pretty bad. Mama taught me that in school. Mama taught me that left isn't good. She even cut the fingers of my left hand with razor blades and slathered them with chili powder to keep me from using them. But I couldn't leave it alone, my bitch of a left hand. And Mama kept spilling tears, and me too. Because me, I understood Mama's eyes. Believe me, Mr. Prosecutor, at the start of the chili powder, Mama's eyes didn't tell me anything. But when she bared herself for the first time in front of Papa and me, when we saw her completely naked memory, me, I couldn't hold back my eyes. And I did everything to know my right hand, but I never saw it. So don't ask me to raise my right hand and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I never had a right hand. Maybe Mama brought me into this world with one hand only, Mr. Prosecutor. Papa thinks that Mama kept my right hand between her thighs, but perhaps you will be able to get it back for me. My damned right hand trapped in Mama's thighs, so Mr. Prosecutor, don't ask me to tell you anything at all. And yet, there's something I want to say to you. There's something I've always wanted to say. To tell the sea to come to us, so people don't have to leave to go see her and leave you with the memory of your mother. To tell the wind to take me with him when he wanders in the baobab treetops. To tell the shooting star to fly me with her to the other stars. I want to say something, but not the truth, your truth. I would like to say something, but I won't raise my right hand. You already know why. So if you like, we will break with that tradition. I'm going to say something without yesterday's bullshit, because with yesterday, they're always singing the same song. With yesterday's drunk face, they always tell you their experience, their point of view above all, the way you're supposed to live where you're supposed to go or not go, whom you should sleep with. Yesterday, they controlled you. They formatted you. It's, it's why the, the memory of Mama forced chili powder on my fingers and told me not to get married because it was polygamy. I already told you, I don't understand all that. Maybe there's not even anything to understand because there's nothing to understand with girls like me. At least that's what Papa said to Mama before the memory of Mama forced her to leave. Papa couldn't deal with Mama anymore. He couldn't take the nakedness of Mama's memory anymore. He didn't understand why Mama forced chili powder on the fingers of my left hand. Papa said to Mama, What is that supposed to mean, to what you're doing to her? What type of witchcraft is that? Don't you understand that we all can't be right-handed? No, I don't understand. I don't accept that my daughter is left-handed. You don't care, do you? I know that you don't care, but let me take care of my daughter. I want to give her a good education. Don't get involved in what doesn't concern me. It does concern me. For once, it concerns me because it's my daughter, too. And I'm not going to let you piss her life away. No, I'm not throwing her life to chance. I want what's good for her. You, you don't care. You're never here. You spend your time playing checkers, getting shit-faced and screwing little girls those little uneducated left-handers, and you want me to abandon her like those little left-handers so that you can screw her next, but I won't let you. I'm going out. I'm leaving. I need to get the hell out of here or else. Or else you'll do what, huh? What else do you know outside of getting shit-faced and screwing little left-handers like your own daughter? <laughs> no, Mr. Prosecutor. <coughs> Papa never touched me. I don't know where Mama have, would have gotten such ideas, but Papa never looked at me. Even for a single second, he wasn't the type to look at his daughter. Papa, at least not with the eyes that Mama was talking about. Papa didn't have time to look at anybody. He calmly drank his beer and he went to play checkers and that's it. 
No, Mr. Prosecutor, my father was sweet, and me, I loved him. And I think that he did too, only, as I told you, it's no longer about understanding us, but to say, to say something, even if there's nothing known, even if there's nothing to say, to say that his daughter was touched, even if, that, even if all that was done was to calmly drink beer and play checkers, you have to say something to be right, to feed the media, to prove that you are someone that you love. But, Mr. Prosecutor, I am neither against nor for. I just want you to allow me to look for one moment at that hill across from us. I just need one moment to hear the joy of the dove who meanders over the bogu. I just want to see a shooting star. Then I will swear to you on that star, on that hill, on that fig tree, that I will return to the courtroom. I'll come back to tell you something, even if I have nothing to tell you. I will try to find my right hand that I left between my mother's thighs, and I will lift it up, and your damn hearing will begin. I will plead guilty because I killed them. Then you will pronounce your verdict. I will respect your verdict, even if I know in advance that it will be shitty, and I will go to my cell bare naked like mama's memory, eyes closed, fists closed. I'll hear nothing more. I'll see nothing more. I'll never say anything, and I'll never leave again. Not from the visiting room, no, Mr. Prosecutor. I want to remain condemned because that's the reality of this century. I accept it, me. I accept the reality, your reality, the reality of reason, the reality of the deal, of the reckoning, of the warped woman, the reality of being nothing at all, the reality of being like you to be something, the reality of fleeing, the sad reality of condemnation, of competition, the reality of being a machine under control 24-7. Yes, Mr. Prosecutor, I assure you that I won't run away from your reality. Before, I despised it, but now I accept it. Not because I'm renouncing my reality, but because I have mama's experience in my ears. Now that I killed them both, I understand papa. I forbid you from thinking, from lying, from saying that I screwed my own daughter. You said it yourself. I'm nothing but a drunk, a checkers player, so leave me to my alcohol and to my game boards. Or else I promise you won't regret it. I've always allowed you to say anything to me, to insult me as if I wasn't your husband, as if I wasn't I, it wasn't I who allowed you to give birth to that poor left-hander that you martyred with your chili powder. And me, I forbid you to say that I martyred her. I don't want my daughter to be left-handed. It's because I love her that I put chili powder in her fingers. You. You don't love her. You don't understand anything. You don't know what a left-hander is. No, you don't love her. You love your bottles and your game pieces and her little left-handed ass. Stop saying that, Antonio. No, I won't stop. I'll even go to the police if you, you don't stop. You're going where? To the police. And what are you going to tell them? That you don't take care of your daughter. In my opinion, you'd better go to social services. Not to the police, because the police don't deal with such things. The police pursue criminals. That's why I'll go to the police, because a father, a so-called father like you, who doesn't worry that his daughter is a left-hander, that she trolls the streets every night with her left hand, with the whore crap in her bag, is a criminal. That type of father is nothing but a criminal, who is happy that his daughter is left-handed because he likes to screw the little left-handed kittens. You want her to remain left-handed. You did everything so that she looked like me, so that she revolved around you. I ask myself if there isn't some demon who pushed me to sleep with you, to dare to live all this time with you. But whatever the monster, I'm going to fuck you all. Because me, I'm like that. But I don't let myself get upset by bitches like you. Go see whomever you want. Tell them whatever you want. I don't care. But if I ever, if I ever hear from the mouth of whomever it may be that you had thought, that you had even insinuated that I had screwed my own daughter because in bringing her into the world, you stole her right hand, and that now you're screwing with her, if I ever again hear my daughter let out one single cry because you're, you forced chili powder in her fingers, I will come back. I swear to you, I'll come back. I'll put aside the alcohol, I'll put aside the game pieces, I'll trample the laws underfoot, and I swear to you on the head of the left hand of that I love. I don't even know why I love her. 
Seeing as how here no one loves left-handers, no more than I know why I love you when you force chili powder in the fingers of, of, our, of our own daughter. I don't know why I don't ask for a divorce, since you suspect me of cheating on you with my own daughter, even though I've never slept with another. When I am happy simply drinking my beer and moving my game pieces, and that now I'm going to have to leave all that and get the hell out. If not, I'll always hear that I screwed the left hand, my daughter, and that will drive me to come back. I'll hear the police bang on my door. And before the police enter, before I open the door to the cops, because I'm going to open the door to them so that they can survey the scene, pick up your body, find my DNA all over your blood, on your body splayed out like a pile of shit, your face in pieces. I'm going to give them my hands for the handcuffs without saying a word. Because talking to the cops doesn't do anything when you're in exile, a fugitive. It doesn't do anything to say one single word to the cops then. They don't want to understand anything. They only want to know if you premeditated the crime. They only want to throw you in jail without understanding that the lady who had your DNA in her mouth, on her face, in her blood, they don't know that you love the body of that lady, that you even had a pretty little left-handed girl, that you loved her. They don't understand, cops, that left-handers are like Africans. No one wants to look at them, house them, accept them, and so they push back, they react. And that's what the cops don't understand. They don't get that blacks react. That now the lady is rid of you, and you rid of her, and that you, you swear that you love her despite everything, but here the cops are not made to understand. The law isn't made to understand. Cops and laws are two assholes made to throw us in jail. That's it. Then what's in jail without you or the left-hander? I'm telling you, I'm telling you that I'll drink beer and I'll move my game pieces and the rest. I don't care about anything. And you will shut up for once. Shut it. Just be quiet. I beg you, don't do anything at all, please. Don't say anything, because if you say something, I will be in jail and you in the cemetery, and the left-hander a shadow without memory, and all that will be stupid. Do you think you're intimidating me with your madness? <laughs> you're mistaken if you think I'm afraid of you, that I'm going to shut up because you've raised your voice, because you're yelling because you think that having balls means prattling on, means planting left-handers in girls' wounds to be able to screw them later, when they're like Africans and no one needs them. You think that's what being a man is? I won't be quiet, as long as you won't take care of her. As long as you keep her in her left-handed state to be able to screw her, I'll go to the police and I'll tell them everything, and you won't have the time to kill me because the police will already be here to collect you. They don't let criminals like you hang out for long, or else it would be disastrous for the mothers and daughters. They're already here, your cops. Soon. Then goodbye. Wait, where are you going? I'm getting the hell out. Where? Maybe I am dumb enough to screw my left hand up, but not as dumb to tell you where the hell I'm going. Stay. Don't leave. It's, it's not good to piss off. It's foolish to leave like that, to erase yourself from your own family. I'm begging you, don't run off. I don't want parts of you, me. I want you whole with your game pieces and your beer bottles. I'll leave you in peace with my stories of cops. If you have to get the hell out, I'll forget the police. I'll shove the laws and the police up my ass now that you want to piss off. I detest them all. Too late. I'm telling you that I didn't go to see anyone. I don't even know where the police station is. I only wanted to know if you loved your family. I didn't understand why you were never worried that our daughter is left-handed, even though everyone hates left-handers. No man wants a left-hander because left-handers, they speak too much. They rebel all the time. And you know too well that you, men, you don't like the girls who don't make it easy. The left-handers don't make it easy. That's why I put chili powder in her fingers to make her make it easy for her to at least have a husband. I didn't understand why they didn't warn me that she is left-handed. So I said to myself, that must work out for you in some way. It works out for you that she is left-handed. That way, you can screw her because she's attracted to no other man besides you. When no one else is interested in girls, they turn to their fathers. That's how it is. I know what I'm talking about. That's, that's it. It's not more complicated than that. 
And I know that's crazy to think, but what do you expect? It's the age itself that's crazy. It's not in fashion to screw your own daughter. It's the time when all the men drool over the asses of their own children. And as a result of seeing all that on TV and hearing all these stupidities on the radio, you end up being crazy, distrusting all men, even you, you see? No, and too late. Men get tired too, you know. It's never too late. Too late. I'm telling you, goodbye. No, I'm telling you it's never too late. For a long time, I believed that it was always too late, but no, because I met you, you alone accepted to look at me, to call me. Before you, no one had ever called me. However, I followed Mama's advice. I never screamed when she put the chili powder on my hand. I was left-handed before I met you. I shook with my left. I ate with my left. I wiped my ass with my left. I kissed only the left cheek. And Mama told me it was impossible <coughs> that I was intolerable because of my left hand. Mama said that no man ever looked at me never screwed me, despite my lipstick, despite my beauty, despite my many visits to the dance clubs, it's because I'm left-handed. Left-handers are bad luck. They drive men away, Mama would say. She said it's like the blacks. If you reject them, if you don't allow them to come to where the whites live, if they don't have papers, even though the tree that made that very paper came from their country, if blacks are deported, thrown out, <coughs> rejected, it's not because you don't like them, it's because they're black. Being black is left-handed. It's having forests, but no paper. I'm so beautiful, as Papa would say. How juicy my butt cheeks are, as Papa would say. A forest at the midpoint between my thighs. A moon smile, as Papa would say. But no man would grant me one second of time. So I no longer believed what Mama would say. I turned to Papa. And Papa said that being left-handed wasn't the problem, that if blacks don't have papers while they have plenty of forests, it's because they make it easy. They let themselves be denied, even from one another. Papa said that he loves me despite me being left-handed. Do you understand? For the first time, a man told me that he loves me. A man, not my father, a man. And me, I, I didn't know how, the man didn't know how, but since then, since that moment where the man said to the left-hander that he loved her, she saw her tongue slide into the man's mouth. And the man said nothing, did nothing for or against it. The man simply put his mouth in the forest that is the midpoint between the thighs of the left-hander. And the fruits, the leaves of the forest fell at that moment. At the moment when the man told the left-hander that he loved her. The birds flew over the forest, situated at the midpoint between my thighs. The two mouths wailed, and Mama arrived. So since then, Mama started to cut my left hand and to force chili powder on it. She didn't say anything anymore, seeing as it was too late for her. But every day I stank of her man's scent. The fruits of the forest continued to drop, despite the chili powder in my fingers. And me too, I said that it was too late. That it wasn't right that I stole the scent of Mama's man. I said that it was over, that I was done. But I couldn't do anything. It's like that as a left-hander. Mama said that left-handers are like blacks. It's not because they're not like that they're denied. It's because they're acting. But Papa said it's because they make it easy. In spite of the forest. And me, I don't want to make it easy despite Papa, who is always in the forest, situated at the midpoint between my thighs, despite Mama, who no longer says anything. I don't want to let you go. Seeing as it is not too late, but it is never too late, or else you wouldn't have come today. You wouldn't have said the same thing to me as Papa. My tongue wouldn't have slid inside your mouth. You wouldn't have replaced Papa in the forest situated at the midpoint between my thighs. You wouldn't have placed another left-hander at the heart of my forest. So you won't go anywhere, because it's your fault. It's your fault if you suspect. Yes, it's your fault. We have if you want. Leave your shitty DNA on my face if that's what you want. Let me, I'm telling you, you, you are the guilty one. It's you who gave me a left-hander, who sooner or later would turn it around, seeing as left-handers, they're like Africans. They sell their forests to whoever, and after they're only Africans without papers. Neither seen nor known of, chased, forced to flee, rejected, exiled, they run away like you. And you, you are obligated to undress, to say nothing like your mother, to know nothing else at all. Leave then. 
If you're afraid of cops, get the fuck out if you don't want to understand me. I'm tired of being naked that no one understands and that we all, we think about it. It's fleeing after having sold the forest and produced left-handers who steal the scent of your man. Go then. Get the hell out and send it to you. Allow me a moment, Mr. Prosecutor. I would like to return to the hill for, for a moment. I would like to go look at the hill stretched out over there. And right afterwards, I'll tell you everything. Even if I have nothing to tell you, but I know that Mama is always crying. As, as soon as I get home, she will immediately throw herself into my bag, and she will look for crap. That crap. I'm looking for the crap you always keep in your bag. What crap, mm -hmm. Mama? Don't play innocent. Don't pretend to not know what I'm talking about. But Mama. And she emptied my purse. She dumped out all of the contents, cigarettes, condoms, lighter, money. What did I do to you? My God, what have I done to deserve this? What's wrong with you, Mama? What's wrong with me? My God, she's even making fun of me. No, I... Shut up! If you open your mouth again, I'll fart in it. Is that clear? <laughs> what didn't I do so that you could be a girl, a real girl, like everyone else? I signed you up for school. I always paid for nice uniforms. I always took you to the hair salon. I always told you that a real woman doesn't cook with her left hand. I spent all my time at your side as if you were my lover, my husband. All that so that you would be good, so that you would be a good girl, well-educated, so that one day a man would marry you to keep you from trolling in the streets like a prostitute, and above all, so that you wouldn't steal his scent from me. But I was wasting my time. You are nothing but a dirty little whore. Who put those thoughts in your head? Why did you wander off? Do you want me to die, is that it? Well, I'm going to die. I'm gonna die and leave you in peace, leave you to live your bitch's life, that of a dirty little whore who doesn't care about her mother. Because you don't love me. I'm gonna disappear and leave you in peace, leave you to be left-handed and not to interest any man except for my man. And you're going to see what it's like for a woman to not interest any man. Not one single man among the millions will look at you, will ask you, even to touch you. And you will know what it is to grab a touch. When no hand will caress the lines of your whore's body, you will understand. When they all end up fucking you and tossing you aside like an orange peel, you will see what it means to fuck your mother over. Above all, don't say anything to me. I don't want to know anything. Your dirty little mouth that knows everything, I'm sick of it. Leave me in peace, I don't want to know anything, I don't want to hear anything, I don't want to understand anything, get the fuck out right now, that's all. It's difficult to get the fuck out, Mama, difficult to leave you in peace. Then I will leave you in peace. No, Mama, don't leave me in peace. Then leave me in peace. When you have disappeared from my heart, then I will leave you in peace. But for the moment, you're there, planted there, even if you think I'm a dirty little whore, even if you think that I smoke, that I take drugs. There you have it. As always, it's me who's being crazy. It's me who's always hallucinating. Your bag's always filled with a horse crap, and it's me who's crazy. What here is a horse crap? You don't know what here is a horse crap. Oh, that's rich. <laughs> the whore doesn't know what crap is whorish. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, me, what's, what's a horse crap. I will teach a horse shit her accessories are. Well, look at me, dear. All these things are a horse crap. I told you to leave me in peace right now. Don't make fun of me, despite being despite because the, despite what you believe, I still have my sense of reason. And she slammed the door in my face, Mr. Prosecutor. And the idea of becoming a prostitute replaced it. For the first time, I opened my pack of cigarettes. For the first time, I lit my lighter. For the first time, I rolled a joint. For the first time. I opened a condom packet. And the whore didn't last long. She left just as quickly. She went to tear open Mama's door. I went home. She was counting a rosary, kneeling before a statue of the Virgin Mary. Mama, it had never been opened, my pack of cigarettes. I never smelled the scent of a condom. The whore never lived in my body. Because you suspect me of coming back every night from the streets, I wanted to know what a cigarette smells like, or a joint, how to put on a condom, 
Otherwise, I just kept them in my purse to be a girl of the times, as they say, so that people would look at me even if I am left-handed. I tried to identify myself. It's a question of not being too uptight, too wild, too stupid, but the foolishness of a prostitute, as you call it, never seduced me. But now that you no longer believe me, I wanted to be a whore, to feel the disgust that it hides the stupidity contained, understand why the whore bothers mama, why the whore who wants to smoke won't smoke, why the girl who wants to sleep with all the men on earth won't fuck them all, why we see the devil everywhere even though the sky is blue, why the left-hander saw her left hand hacked with the blade and burned by chili powder, and yet I always called you mama. I didn't leave, I didn't go to see UNICEF or the media to tell them that mama ch put chili powder on my left hand. I didn't even scream to alert the neighbors, I just understood. I just accepted that you were taking care of me in your own way, that you loved me in your own way. I simply believed you without seeking to, without seeking to know if mama was right or not, because I had nothing to do about it, whether you were right or not, whether you were mistaken or not. Seeing as everyone is wrong sometimes, we assert ourselves, we set up experiments as masters. I made it easy, but you, you don't play the game. You don't try to understand me. You just want me to be the way you want me to be and, and for everyone to sing your praises as an exemplary mother, that you have educated your daughter well. You are alone in your concerns, and me, I have to deal with it. I'm going to do it, Mom. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. For the first and the last time, I don't smoke anymore. My bag will be emptied or filled with anything I want, and you'll not, no longer have to count your rosary. I just want you to check one thing. I just want you to see if something deep in me is still in place. Check that it hasn't been touched yet. I want you to check if the orange inside my orange tree still has its juice, Mama. Wear a condom, Mama. Whores have AIDS, based on what they say. I don't want to contaminate you if the whore is encrusted in the orange deep, housed deep inside of me. Go ahead. And after, I'll kiss you, Mama. And you will see if my saliva has the taste of a prostitute. After your exam, whether I pass or fail, I will run away into the bolu, and I will watch the doves soaring above the neem trees and the fig trees, and I will say nothing ever again. I will forget my left hand, and I will always understand you. You see, Mr. Prosecutor, allow me just one moment to understand, to understand how a beautiful evening when you were across from the hill, that hill on which one beautiful evening he told you that he carried you in him, that right away you told him, without asking yourself any questions, without seeking to know if he was sincere or not, despite Mama's distrust. Because Mama knows that on those hills, in those gardens, in those bars, on the streets, the lie is planted. On that hill, two years since I had been with him, since I had smeared him with three other women, on that hill then, Mr. Prosecutor, he told me. I'm packing my bags. I'm taking a flight in a week. What are you doing, Mr. Prosecutor? Tell me what to do. You who know everything, you who have experience, you who know all the written laws, you who condemn me. I'm packing my bags. I'm taking a flight in a week. Mr. Prosecutor, what do I do? When the dove disappears, what do I do? When the sky loses its blue color, what do I do? When the neem trees, and the fig trees turn yellow, what do I do? Because I am left-handed, and being left-handed is being African, Mama says that it's because Africans are black. People don't like them. It's because they're without papers. But Papa says it's because they sell their forests and make it easy. Mr. Prosecutor, what do I do now that there are no more forests for the papers? Since the sea isn't here, since there's no wheat here, to be black is to be African, and to be African is to be left-handed when, le when I left my right hand in my mother's thighs. Do I play the hypocrite? Do I 
ask him why he went back to the sea? Do I play the abandoned lover and cry out and beg him to stay? I play the girl who is, who is happy to see her guy get the hell out and jump and throw my arms around his neck to lie to him that I am proud of him, that I'm happy that he's leaving? Or, or do I assault him with the questions of this type? Why do you want to leave even though we're good together on this hill? You don't love me anymore, is that why you're leaving? Is it your family that's making you leave or uh, over there? It's the same as over here, you know that, you know that, right? You're not going to cheat on me over there, are you? Do I play the lost girl because the guy I love is leaving? What would you do, Mr. Prosecutor, on that hill when the sky loses its color, when the dove disappears? when the fig trees and the neem trees are on strike because they heard. I'm packing my bags. I'm taking a flight in a week. Not even a week. Tomorrow. In just a few hours, Mr. Prosecutor, and in a few hours only, he packed his bags. I, don't, I didn't ask him why. I could care less why. Because I know that in this country, they're all programmed to get the hell out. And it's not difficult to understand. You just have to open your eyes and see that here, there is no sea. That all the suns have the same face. Everyone counts on everyone else, even though everyone says to everyone else that they are nothing. Because the earth has been sold. The sun sold, gasoline sold, cocoa sold, cotton sold, all the forests desecrated. And so you and me, we are nothing because there, there it is. It's too easy, it's too stupid. We are African, we are not American, we are not French, we are not Chinese, we are not Palestinian, we are not Japanese. There it is, it's too simple, it's, it's too stupid, Mr. Prosecutor. But it's like that, it's like that. Like that, you sell everything. It's stupid what happened to us, but I can't do anything if, if we were persuaded to sell everything to convince them that they are nothing and, and, and that they have to be American or French or Italian or Canadian to be guys, chicks, happy mamas and papas. So I didn't answer, I didn't cry, I didn't laugh. I didn't listen for a moment to the wind, the sea, the TV, the dream that like the waves of the wild sea were dragged off far away over there. But I listened to the anger and emptiness around us that kicked him in the butt to, get him, to make him get the hell out. Listen to everything without hearing anything, without crying, without laughing. No, Mr. Prosecutor, I listened to this emptiness and I understood his need to leave. Allow me then to go listen and I will come back to tell you something. I promise you that I will come back to tell you something, that which you want to hear. I will tell you that it was I who killed them. The families will cry, I know. Everyone will forever loathe me, I know. My co-wives will blame me for having taken their husband away, I know. The defense will go on and on, demonstrating that they are eloquent, I know, I know, I know all of that, Mr. Prosecutor. My attorney, I, I don't need one. Even if the law says I must, me, I won't say anything if I have a lawyer. If you want me to give you your truth, that everyone see you on TV like all of those left-handers who sold everything and got the hell out. Don't stick a lawyer on my case. So if I don't have a lawyer, I will come back to you in the courtroom in a few moments. Trust me. Put surveillance cameras all around if you want. Put watchdogs all over if you want. Elite snipers on all the roofs and trees. Do what you want to, as you want to. If like mama, you don't trust me. After all, you have the right not to trust me to trust in your laws and your experiences of, of tracking criminals like me. You have the right to be like mama, like mama who said to me, I don't understand that way of seeing things. I'm telling you that that way of several loving the same <coughs> man lowers women to her position of being dominated, a slave of the male. Me, I'm telling you that I don't like that way of loving. I don't like my daughter's way of loving who turned herself into a reproductive apparatus, a machine in which the man she pretends to love comes to her when he feels like depositing an egg in the machine and stands there with his arms crossed for nine months, waiting for her to push out a baby for him. No, I don't like her way of loving. I'm telling you clearly and openly, then 
do whatever you want. Thank you, Mama, but me, I, I like my way of loving. And him, does he love you? Are you sure that he loves you? With three other wives, does he have the time to love you? I don't know, Mama, but I don't care. You will see. You will see that I'm right despite everything you believe, despite all the illusions that cloud your eyes. You will see that I am your mother, and thus I know more than you. That I speak to you from experience. You'll see that you will be abandoned like one piece of shit for another. You will see that time will harass you, and believe me, when time corners us from every side, we spoil not on the outside, no. We wither from the inside, in our guts, in the most noble part of a woman. And when time has rotted you from the inside, you will begin to whine like a bitch harassed by a pack of dogs. Except that in your case, these will be other bitches, two, three, four bitches who monopolize your mate. Then the more you whine, the more time will rot you from the inside, nice and deep until your guts secrete jealousy, hatred, and welcome the war between the bitches pursuing the same mate. Farewell to your way of loving, you will see. You will see, my dear, that you will pick up your odds and ends. With a little luck, you'll have your face disfigured, your spirit faded, your gleaming eyes. You will see, you'll see, my daughter, and me. I will be the same when you get back here, because mother and daughter are one contagious disease. <laughs> <laughs> so you have every right, Mr. Prosecutor. Like me, I had the right to not take, to not take Mama's advice into consideration. I didn't care about Mama's experience. I didn't care that this man had multiple wives. No, Mr. Prosecutor, because I didn't want to own him. Because what me, I know, and Mama doesn't know, is that owning means losing. When you own what you love, you will lose it. Inevitably, you will lose it. Because no one likes to be owned. Even your dog doesn't like to be owned. Otherwise, he bites you. He gives you back the rage that you infected him with by owning him. Those who possess the laws will always be exploited. The rich will always be bitten by the poor. And in the end, there will be chaos, destruction, Seeing as a whole world will be owners, you, the laws for condemning the rich, their bank accounts and their weapons for beating down the poor, the Africans, their hatred towards those who, who dispossessed them of everything, the criminals, their guns, and in the end, there will be shots fired. There will be shots fired everywhere. There will be shots fired towards the end, Mr. Prosecutor, and this will be hell fucked up because of our possessive insanity, because of our egoism. We all want to be at the summit of the bulgu, looking down at the others below us. And that, Mr. Prosecutor, is not pretty. I assure you, it is not pretty. That's why I content myself to stay at the bottom of the bulgu. Allow me then one moment to return to the base of the bulgu. Then I will come back to you to, to, to tell you something. Just let me go to smile at the dove that skims the flanks of the sky with its wings. Let me just see the sun close its eyes. Then I will come back to, to tell you what you want to hear. I will tell you that a few days after his... I'm packing my bags. I'm leaving. After the dove... After, after the dove has disappeared, after the sky has taken a color other than blue, the fig trees and the neem trees have started their strike after the sea, the money, the drought, the lack of jobs, the few that own everything, after all that has taken away our men, he left, Mr. Prosecutor. I didn't kiss him, I didn't look at him, I didn't cry, I didn't laugh, I didn't accompany him to the airport, I didn't make love to him, he didn't screw me, I didn't say goodbye to him. It wasn't my turn, but someone else's. The second wives. Each of us had one week. And when it wasn't my week, I was at the Bulgu. It's like that when you love the same person and me. It didn't bother me that they loved the same person as me because that gave me more people to love. Especially since now, it's difficult to find people to love. There are no people who love you because you won't find any, seeing as people all run up to the summit of the hill towards ownership. 
People spend their time singing to you, I want my own house, I want my own car, I want my own bank account, I want my own Boeing, I want my own moon, I want to win the Goncourt Prize, I want to be French, I want to be American, I want to be Italian white Matisse, I want my own France, I want Trump's America, I want an Africa attached to my Europe. I want to be Ronaldinho or Zidane or Pelé or Maradona. I want to be Bob Marley or Alpha Blondi or Johnny Ali. And I want, I want, I want, I want, Mr. Prosecutor. But me, I didn't want anything that day. When after five years of absence, he came back. He had returned with a fifth wife, Mr. Prosecutor. He met her over there, and it's normal for a woman to meet a man and for a man, if he is already the husband of four women meeting another woman, to not tell her that he's already taken, <laughs> as we would say here, because she wouldn't understand, wouldn't accept, because she wants to own him. And me, I know that even dogs don't accept that. And me, I'm telling you to leave me the fuck alone. I'm telling you that I'm sick of not being able to leave just to rejoin the Volgu, to look at the dove and the shooting star and the fig trees and the neem trees. And I'm telling you that I will not lift my right hand. I can't do anything about it if my right hand stays trapped in mama's thighs. Leave me the fuck alone, I'm telling you. I need to look at something other than your ugly face. I want to go back to the trees, the dogs, the moon that disappears over there, the wind that carries away those we love the rain that doesn't come here anymore, and everybody who runs, runs, runs towards there, where it rains, where the sea is, where our forests have gone, where, where there, where you can become something, there where you own, and me, I'm fucking with you, Mr. Prosecutor. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to beat you like I beat him, like them, her and him even though I didn't want to touch them. But what do you want, Mr. Prosecutor? When you are left-handed, you're African, and Africans are blacks, as they say, and as they say, blacks can only do lefty things, poor as crap, mama's way of speaking. But maybe mama was right. Maybe I am a dirty little whore. I don't know, Mr. Prosecutor. I told you I don't know anything, not even the truth. So what do you want me to tell you when I have nothing to say? I just want to hear the verdict that the cell be open for me, so that, com so that completely naked with my left-handed hand memory, I will go to the window and look out at the Volgu. The sky, the fig trees, the dove, everything else, I don't care. After his return, even then I ask nothing of him, not even to fuck me, not even to buy me clothes, not even to look at me. I accepted becoming his cousin, his sister, because the white woman decided that we were all his cousins, his sisters. <laughs> and I cooked for them, for him and his white woman. Every morning, every noon, every night, I made their bed, I cleaned the sheets. No, Mr. Prosecutor, becoming my husband's cook didn't bother me at all. What bothered me, what bothered my left hand, more precisely, was when we crossed paths in the kitchen by accident, him and me, like under the bulgu, my mouth moved towards his mouth. I don't know why. My mouth was maybe too dry, I don't know. You know, Mr. Prosecutor, what that's like? The drought of a mouth. Like the land, my mouth was dry and naturally moved towards his tongue. His tongue that, has, that had disappeared for five years from this one. His tongue that had been in the white woman's mouth every day. So my tongue moved towards his mouth to wet itself just a little, just a little after five years of thirst. Five years during which I had shut down my whole body exactly, Mr. Prosecutor, exactly like the bodies that you lock up. These bodies that you throw in jail with your stupid laws, but he, he understood nothing. Didn't want to understand anything. He pushed me aside like a piece of shit a big load of shit. He pushed, pushed us aside, me and my mouth parched for him. 
even though I had accepted becoming his cousin. I had accepted becoming the servant of his wife, even though I didn't want to own him. So Mr. Prosecutor, I don't know any more about it. I already told you I know nothing. Condemn me and leave me in peace. Because if he hadn't pushed me, if he hadn't had that knife, if I hadn't had that knife in my hand, if she hadn't by chance come into the kitchen, I don't know anything, Mr. Prosecutor. I won't tell you anything. Stick me with the verdict that you like, the verdict that suits criminals of my background. Do what, what you want with me, but leave me in peace. I don't want anything else. I just want to go for one moment by the Bogu. I just want to watch the dove caress the sky with its wings. I just want to see a shooting star. All the rest, the big mess that I don't understand. And Mama was right. It's time that harasses us. And when you have time on your heels, the prosecutor on your ass, the tongue that's drying out, and him pushing you away, you are forced to react like Papa's blacks. So with the knife in your left hand, all you can do is stab him in the heart, in the throat, in the fucking throat that he rejected you with. Everything else is a mess, Mr. Prosecutor. A mess that your cousin, the white woman, infiltrated. The white woman slipped into this mess, and me, I was forced to send the knife into her heart. I don't know why I reacted to the mess of the moment, and that's it. Because despite everything, it's Papa and Mama who are right. Not you, Mr. Prosecutor. No, you can't be right. Only Papa and Mama are right. These times are messed up and we're rotting away from the inside. Only knots in our guts. Knots, Mr. Prosecutor. The times are shitty. And Africans are forced to leave, seeing as that they were dispossessed of everything and that now they're without forests, without sea, without oil, without land, without cotton. That's everything I know, Mr. Prosecutor. The rest, it's my tongue that knows. It's my knife that knows. These are the witnesses that know. Interrogate them, Mr. Prosecutor. I will confess everything. I will lift my left hand, and I will swear to tell you.
Thank you for staying. Um, I'm Heather Denyer. I'm a student here, PhD candidate here at the Graduate Center. Uh, and my dissertation is on gender and sexuality in Francophone theater in Burkina Faso, as well as Benin and Togo. Um, I came to know this play when I was in France in 2015. And when I saw it performed, um, Aristide was directing himself. It really sort of settled me into my dissertation uh, and it has left an impression on me ever since. So I'm really happy to be sharing it tonight. Um, Aristide Tarnagda is not only a playwright, but also an actor himself, a director, and he runs the theater festival that Franck mentioned before called the Recreatral, which happens every other year in Burkina Faso in Ouagadougou. And this is a particularly exciting festival uh, because in uh, addition to presenting new plays that are developed on site, they do it in uh, an outside uh, neighborhood where people wouldn't normally go to the theater. Uh, people who come in to work on the projects are housed by local families and the, the projects are presented in the courtyards of the local families. Um, so it's really exciting work. And not only do they do the shows, uh, and we have a festival coming up, they have a festival coming up, but I hope to be there uh, in uh, the fall. Uh, but not only do they present the shows every other year, but they also have workshops over the course of the year for playwrights, for directors, for designers as well. And one of the ways that Aristide started as a writer was at this festival himself, where he worked with uh, Ivorian playwright Kofek Wahule. Um, so, alors, euh, j'ai fait une petite petite traduction de son essai. Um, so, uh, I think that one of the things that was most important for us working on this yesterday was discussing uh, the situation in uh, Burkina Faso and how he got his inspiration for writing this play, and also, of course, uh, the notion of left-handedness, which is foreign to us in the United States, but is very prominent in the play. Est-ce que tu peux tu peux nous dire ce que tu as expliqué hier quand tu as commencé à l'écouter de la pièce quand tu as été à Rennes? Donc bonsoir. Donc euh, tout d'abord, j'aimerais féliciter l'équipe qui a travaillé au, autour du texte. Just like, would like to congratulate the team who worked on this. And good evening. Ça fait toujours plaisir euh, d'entendre son, son texte, son travail euh, dans, dans une autre langue. It's always a great pleasure to hear your work in another language. Donc, et malgré le fait que mon anglais soit euh, bad, mauvais. <laughs> and in spite of the fact my English being bad. Voilà, je suis, euh, j'ai été ému. I was very moved. Et donc, euh, ben ça, ça, je les remercie pour cela. And I thank you for that. Donc, je profite aussi de remercier ceux qui m'ont invité. Euh, Jeanne, que j'ai rencontrée à Limoges, et puis à Ouagadougou, et puis euh, Franck, qui a, a pris le relais. Euh, je fais tout ce protocole parce que, euh, en, tant que en tant que Burkinabé et en tant qu'Africain, euh, c'est toujours euh, important d'être invité ailleurs, non pas pour euh, euh, prendre ou mendier, mais pour participer à la pensée, à la pensée, à la pensée du monde. Et c'est très important. Um, so we'd like to thank Jeanne, and I was happy for meeting her in Limoges. Thank you to Franck, and is really happy to be here as uh, an African to participate in the global thought and the global conversation. Um, yeah. Voilà. Euh, donc, euh, l'idée de ce texte m'est venue à, quand j'étais en résidence à Rennes en 2007. Um, when, you were in when he was in residence at Rennes in 2007. Alors donc je profite de remercier les représentants de l'Institut français parce qu'à l'époque j'avais eu une bourse au visa pour la création pour être en résidence à Rennes. Um, he had a grant from the French Institute for his residency at Rennes. Et donc j'avais été accueilli par un collectif qui s'appelle Lumière d'août et puis euh, le théâtre national de Bretagne, le TNB. À l'époque c'était Stanislas Nordet qui dirigeait le, le théâtre. So it was so you were uh, welcomed by a collective that was called Lumière d'août, and uh, so I missed the. Vous pouvez répéter, pardon, le, le the, the National Theatre. The, and the National Theatre. Stanislas Nordi. Ouais. 
Et, et donc, euh, parmi euh, euh, le, le, les membres du collectif, il y a une fille, une autrice qui s'appelle Marine Bachelot et qui est très activiste. There was um, in the collective one of the artists who was, whose name was, pardon, elle s'appelait Marine Bachelot. Marine Bachelot, who was um, an activist. Et donc, elle m'avait invité à aller manifester uh, devant le centre de rétention de Rennes. And she invited um, him to participate in a protest in front of the um, a detention center in Rennes. Je sais pas si ici ça dit quelque chose aux gens, mais le centre de rétention c'est c'est un, une espèce de prison où l'on retient euh, ceux qui sont sans papier en attendant leur expulsion. And a, de de a detention center there, it's not quite the same as what you think of here, but it's where they would house people who were there without um, papers, who were there illegally. Et a, a prison, yes, yes. Et donc le, le centre de rétention à Rennes était à l'époque un peu en brousse, complètement à l'écart de la ville. C'était dans une espèce de forêt. Uh, the prison was a away from the town and it was in a forest. Et donc quand j'étais là, j'avais trouvé ça très marrant parce qu'il paraît qu'on fait le papier avec le forêt, mm -hmm. le, le, la forêt, le bois. Oh, and it was, uh, he found that rather funny that to, um, because they were without papers and yet they were in a forest. Et que certainement dans ce temps de rétention, il y avait des Camerounais qui ont plein de forêts, des Ivoiriens qui ont plein de forêts, des Guinéens qui ont plein de forêts, mais qui n'avaient pas le papier. Yes, so the Guineans, Ivorians in, a, in the middle of a forest, but could not get papers. Voilà, donc euh, l'idée d'écrire une façon d'aimer est partie vraiment de, de là. And so the idea of, of the metaphor of the papers in the forest came from this. Et puis c'est parti aussi de la lecture d'un livre. Quand je suis rentré de la manifestation, euh, j'avais loué un appartement qui appartenait à une fille et puis j'ai jeté un coup d'œil dans sa bibliothèque. So uh, he had rented an apartment from a girl in Rennes and he read a book that was found in the li her library. Et j'ai vu euh, un livre euh, dont le titre m'a beaucoup interpellé. Ça s'appelait La première et la dernière liberté de Krishnamurti. And one book particularly caught his interest, which was The First and Last li uh, Liberty by, pardon, c'est de qui l'auteur? Krishnamurti. C'est un Indien. Krishnamurti. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ok, un Indian yogi. Et, et donc, euh, voilà, voilà d'où sont parties les sources de, de façon d'aimer. And this was another, so this book was also a source of inspiration for a way in which to liberate yourself. Mais comme tout auteur, j'avais aussi mes raisons inconscientes. And like any author, there were also plenty of unconscious reasons for writing voilà. it. Voilà. Alors, est-ce que tu peux, est-ce que tu peux nous expliquer un, uh, sorry, uh, est-ce que tu peux nous expliquer un peu um, ce que ça veut dire être gauchère uh, au Burkina Faso Qu'est-ce que ça a beaucoup à voir avec le problème de cette, uh, cette fille En anglais J'ai demandé de expliquer ce que ça veut dire être left-handed au Burkina Faso. Être gauchère ou être gaucher euh, C'est pareil. C'est pas parce que c'est là j'ai écrit pour une fille. Mais en fait, euh, comme je le disais hier à, à, à l'équipe euh, qui a fait la lecture, c'est quelque chose qui a à voir avec la métaphysique, euh, une certaine conception euh, de cette euh, partie euh, des mamans. -là. Donc la gauche est un peu euh, très mal vue. Ah, bon. Merci. Um, so whether you're a left-handed man or a left-handed woman, it doesn't matter. There is a sort of conception of that part of your body, your left hand, as being... Bad. Parce qu'on considère que euh, c'est très mauvais et il est même question que ce sont des gens qui ne, qui ne sont pas faciles, euh, qui sont... Pardon. There, and there is the perception that people who are left-handed are difficult. De, des gens qui sont suivis par des esprits qui sont gauchers et ces esprits-là les poussent à, par exemple, être violents, And they, the people who are left-handed are could be followed by spirits, and these spirits might push them to do things that are violent or bad. À être bagarreur et aggressive. Très colérique pour un rien, il s'énerve. Aggressive, angry, easily angered. Et aussi à porter la poisse. Quand tu es une femme, par exemple, on dit que quand tu es, es gauchère, tu portes la poisse à, à, à ton mari, et l'homme, c'est pareil. Porter la poisse. Euh, la malchance. 
Uh, you could uh, bring uh, bad, so a, a woman who is left-handed could bring bad luck to her husband. Uh, tu peux même aller jusqu'à, enfin, pas toi, mais l'esprit qui, qui, qui t'habite, l'esprit gaucher qui t'habite et qui est excessivement jaloux peut aller jusqu'à tuer. Le conjoint ou la conjointe. Et donc, ceux qui fait que euh, quand tu es, quand es gaucher, euh, ça, ça fait peur à ton, à ton, ben, à ton entourage, ben, comme l'histoire de cette fille. Et donc, être handed peut alarmer ou causer peur à la personne autour de toi. Et donc, mais symboliquement, c'est comme si tu étais une espèce de, euh, comment dire, de, 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 de paria. So, sim, so symbolically, you become like a pariah. Euh, voilà, c'est un peu ça. Là. Ouais. Um, merci beaucoup. Um, I, I want to uh, ask Karim, who directed, and the actors who performed, if they had any thoughts that they'd like to add about... Uh, bringing these, life, uh, these words to life from an American perspective, uh, acknowledging the, 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 the considerable background uh, of, of the play. Uh, sure. This is Nathan Hinton. Is this on? Can you hear me? I think one of the really cool things about the challenge of this piece is that when Heather translated it, uh, she really captured this kind of stream of consciousness feel that Aristide has in the, in the play. Now, when you're going to kind of break that down <laughs> and uh, separate it as an actor, it becomes like kind of crazy because you're looking at a lot of commas and very few periods. <laughs> But there's a poetry within that, right, that lasts more than just like a couple of lines. It lasts several paragraphs. And if you just follow that stream of consciousness, you get a sense of the kind of... Um, the space and the place and the symbols that he's talking about, that's his world and that's not our world, um, that we can kind of um, you know, translate to American <laughs> and kind of present to you. So I found that uh, wonderful, um, that sort of transaction. And Nathan, probably we should explain that when Aristide wrote in French, he didn't distinguish who speaks when. He just has no characters distinguished at all. Um, and, so, and so it was uh, we who divided it and then uh, yes. discussed that a little bit with him yesterday. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the, the translation was so beautifully done and, and I think the way sort of the various voices in the piece were sort of conveyed really helped to uh, sort of create a sense of action mm -hmm. through it. What was so illuminating yesterday, because, you know, bringing Aristide into the process, we had a day to sort of put this together, but sort of understanding the root of the symbolism in it was so moving to me because you can sort of perceive it on the page, but then Aristide has a, is a beautifully eloquent speaker, as you guys can all see, and sort of just in these very in this very generous way, sort of unpacked some of the symbology for us as artists, allow us to sort of, at least for me as the director, to kind of understand it in a very clear mm -hmm. way that made it feel very accessible and human, and though it's so rooted in, he, he uses the word metaphysical a lot, which I think is such a fantastic word in the work that we do as theater artists, but to take that sort of, metaf the metaphysical ideas that are existing in the culture of Burkina Faso, but also it's a sort of within the human condition, um, and that felt so alive and accessible, both in the, obviously in the piece, in the, in the, in the translation of it, and then in the wonderful performances. So it was a real gift of a piece to work on. J'aimerais ajouter justement que pour moi, c'est pas euh, la gauche, c'était un prétexte, euh, juste pour parler des gens qui sont de l'Africain que je suis, du Burkina que je suis, euh, qui se sent marginalisé, exclu, euh, qui ne peut pas voyager comme tout le monde. Euh. Um, he just wanted to emphasize that you know, the left-handed is a metaphor for being an African and not having the ability to travel as everybody else, to be feeling marginalized. Donc, il subit euh, un certain... C'est pas pour faire... pour jouer au, euh, à la victime, 
mais c'est quand même une réalité que nous subissons un regard euh, condescendant. And of course, not to play the victim, but it is a reality that, that lives, every, they live every day. Voilà, donc pour, pour moi, c'était une façon d'aimer, c'était un prétexte pour par, passer par l'intime, mais pour soulever euh, toutes ces questions euh, politiques euh, afin de... Quand, quand on a joué cette pièce à, à Ouagadougou, euh, c'était très étonnant comment ça collait avec l'actualité parce que récemment, des frères euh, étaient vendus euh, en Libye. Donc, c'était intéressant de faire ce play de vie dans récemment en Ouagadougou parce qu'il y avait un cas récent de frères qui ont été vendus en Libye. C'est un problème plus large. Je ne sais pas combien d'entre vous êtes conscients de ça, qu'il y a des gens qui sont en train d'être vendus en Libye en ce moment de Libye. Voilà, donc euh, c'est ça qui était important pour moi, c'est au-delà de la considération traditionnelle métaphysique, c'est justement la symbolique euh, du rejeté, du, de l'exclu, euh, qui était plus important pour moi. So it was the symbol of, of the excluded person, which is much more important than maybe the specifics of left-handedness. Um, we should open it up to questions that anybody might have about the play for the actors, uh, for Karim, <coughs> for RST. Yes? I have a question about, about the right hand things. Yeah, we are oh, sorry, yeah. streaming. <laughs> no. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the right hand being attached to the mother's thigh. What does that <laughs> as symbolism pertains to? Mm -hmm. uh, Ça, ça, ça veut dire simplement qu'elle est gauchère. C'est une façon métaphorique de, euh, de dire euh, ben, acceptez-moi tel que je suis. De toute façon, euh, je suis venu au monde avec euh, une seule main, c'est la, la gauche. C'est juste une métaphysique de décrire que c'est la façon dont elle est venue au monde. C'est juste comme ça que ça c'est pas un choix. Voilà, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a choice. Uh, yes. Hello, thank you all. This question is for Heather and for the actors, uh, or the director, I suppose. And the question is about registers of language, um, because there, there's very close coincidence of a very poetic language and then this sort of grotesque, everyday uh, register. And how do you navigate that as actors and as a translator? Uh, I honestly, as um, translate, maybe translate. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, de langage parce qu'il y a quand même la côté poétique. Il y a aussi le côté quotidien assez vulgaire uh, avec les, les mots gros mots. Alors, comment naviguer ça en tant que traductrice et en tant que acteur, comédien et metteur en scène? As much as possible, I try to keep the text as close to possible as his when he uses words like la putain the whore, um, because, uh, because that's part of the poetry um, and also part of uh, connecting on different levels of realities in the, in the play, I feel. Uh, I really don't like microphones. Can you hear me? It's going to be it's recorded. Be recorded. That's why. Okay, it's, uh, great. <laughs> is this on? Right now it is. OK, hello. Um, <laughs> so I can only say that, um, I can only address that question, which is a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that. Um, by saying that a word, every word has its own value and meaning. Um, and so I hope I can curse on this recording. But um, the word, even you might think that the word fuck is base or, you know, it says I'm like, one line I have is like, I'm going to fart in your mouth or something like that, right? That, even that word, to be a little bit of a linguist, like nerd, um, fuck is actually pretty uh, ancient, but also very poetic. So when we say the word fuck, we are biting at someone. The first, if you make an F sound, it's and then uh, is so literal and deep, it comes from the gut, and then cuh. So you're literally uh, You're attacking someone. So it may sound like, oh, I'm going to fart in your mouth and fuck, whatever, whatever. But it's actually just as poetic as the other language that he uses. And what I think is incredible is that he somehow, maybe, I don't know if probably knows this, but knows this, um, and which is why, it, as an actor, 
it is something that is that you have to get used to because you're not used to doing that. Like a lot of people don't write like that, but once you just give into it, it informs you about the character, it informs you about the story and the relationship in a way that is so unique and so like yeah, it makes it e it doesn't make it's not easy, but it makes it easier. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Hello, and thank you very much to everyone for the, for the work. I'm, I'm curious about kind of following this question about the language and the, the difference in the, 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 the po poetry and then the vulgarity. I'm curious about the performing, how it's performed. Um, are you also playing, not in a reading, of course, this is one way, right? Uh, but when it's up on its feet and fully produced, what is the kind of performance style. I don't like using that word, but is it realism? Are you going for realism or are you going for something like the language? So I'll just uh, point out that when it was performed, when I saw it in, in France and then when it's been performed since, uh, it was Aristide Tarnaga's own production. He directed himself with uh, two Burkinabe actresses who are phenomenal, and a male musician who accompany the play with, uh, with the guitar as well as the speaking the lines. Um, si tu veux uh, discuter un peu comment tu as fait la mise en scène uh, à Limoges, et puis uh, à Ouagar. Alors, donc, euh, <laughs> c'est compliqué de parler de son propre travail. <laughs> it's uh, a little complicated to speak about your own work. Je sais, c'est une position plus confortable je vois, quand je vois les autres uh, Jouer. It's more comfortable to watch other people play. Non, quand je, quand je voulu, <coughs> quand je voulu monter euh, façon d'aimer, ben il s'est posé la même question. Combien d'actrices, combien d'actrices? Euh, euh, so when I decided I wanted to put this up, I had to decide, you know, how many actors, how many actresses. Faut-il euh, le faire avec une voix ou avec plusieurs? Should it be one voice? Should it be multiple voices? Et donc la question de la figure m'a plus intéressé. La figure de la femme. And the question of the, pardon, le, la figure. Euh, je ne sais pas comment on dit ça. Le... Like the fugue? Ouais. Like the figure? La figure, le, le symbole the, de, and de the symbol, la femme. Okay, the figure of, of, the, of the woman. Et donc, euh, il ne se posait plus de la question du, tellement du rôle, mais de deux actrices qui portaient une histoire. And he was interested in interrogating, having two women, two women tell this story. Et de temps en temps, eh ben, ces deux actrices jouaient des rôles de mère et de, de fille. And at different moments, both actresses play the role of mother and play the role of daughter. Et j'ai aussi mis un musicien. And you also had a musician. Qui était d'ailleurs là il n'y a, a pas longtemps. Il était aux États-Unis ici en tournée. Oh, and he was he toured in the United States recently. Voilà, et, et, et parce que euh, je, il, il me semble que dans deux de mes textes comme ça, celui-là, et, et si je les tuais tous, madame, les voix ont besoin d'être prolongées. The, in, in both of his texts, he has the impression that les voix, pardon. Les voix, le, oui. ben les, les, oh, le voice. Les voix. Oui, les voix, ouais, les voix ont besoin d'être prolongées. C'est-à-dire que il y a des cris, il y a des cris euh, que les mots n'arrivent pas à, à charrier jusqu'au bout. That one voice couldn't by itself go all the way as far as it needed to. Voilà. Et donc, je fais appel à ce, music, à ce musicien pour prolonger la voix de ces femmes. And so the work of the musician was to, to expand and project the mais, voices of the women. Mais aussi pour être l'homme, symboliquement. And to also be sim symbolically... L'homme, l'homme, symboliquement. Oh, the, yes, to the, so the music was in the play, the symbol of the man. Et donc tout le travail était aussi de respecter la, la structure du texte, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a des moments où la langue s'envole. Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm like listening in the... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Oui, de, de, de la langue, c'est ce que vous appelez poétique, c'est-à-dire qu'à un moment donné, euh, on est dépassé euh, par sa propre... On va ailleurs. Il mm -hmm. euh, y a quelque chose, la langue euh, décolle. Mm -hmm. 
so it's like as with the help of the music, as if the language is moving beyond itself, like take, taking off. Je pense qu'on en a besoin au théâtre, tout comme on a besoin qu'à un moment donné aussi la langue redevienne concrète. So language, in th especially in theater, becomes less concrete and more, more musical, more metaphysical. Donc voilà, tout le travail était de fabriquer un objet poétique avec à la fois quelque chose qui est euh, poétique, mais aussi euh, quelque chose qui est concret. So the work became to create a poetic object with material that was at once poetic and also concrete. Voilà. And also very political as well. Uh, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. I did want to point out that um, this play is published in French with another play um, called Terre Rouge, which is uh, a story about two brothers, one who remained in Burkina Faso, one who went to Europe, and how they converse via letters. And that, um, that collection, the two, just was awarded a huge prize, as selected as the single uh, French literature standout for last year, like two weeks ago. Okay. Um, Aristide, Aristide has obviously written a lot of other plays, uh, and uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you about them uh, afterwards at the, the archive, right? After the next reading. Um, please come back on Saturday for the, the reading of Cameroonian Eduardo Alvis Bouvuma's play in, uh, in War as in Games. And thank you so much for coming tonight. And um, <clears throat> I also would like to uh, thank Heather for bringing the play to us and for doing a fantastic translation. It's a fantastic work and all the best also for your work and thank you really for coming here and participating. It was a very great reading, Karim and the actors. Thank you so much.